Amako. Tsogo Zani. Much of what we know about Africa and ourselves as Africans doesn't come from us, but from non-Africans, many who have a very low opinion of us. Not only is our being colonized, but our very concept of knowledge is colonized. Therefore, as Africans, the question of historiography should be at the heart of the concept of decolonization. As you know, historiography concerns itself with the philosophy and the theory of history. As Africans, historiography nudges us to ask the questions, who writes our history today? Who asks the critical, epistemological, ontological, and phenomenological questions? And who answers those questions? In our understanding of self and the world today, is our understanding a colonized or a decolonized one? Informed by these discomforting questions of being, I wish to briefly speak to the following themes. One, what do we mean by decolonization? Two, decolonization as spiritual liberation. Three, decolonization as cultural liberation. And four, how should we as Africans respond? To understand decolonization, we must first understand colonization. As a point of departure, it is important to make the point that when we as Africans talk of colonization or slavery on the continent, we tend to focus almost exclusively on the Europeans and forget the Arabs. More than a thousand years before the Europeans invaded Africa, Africa's invaders came from Western Asia, now strangely referred to as the Middle East. Middle East of what? During the 7th century, the Arabs invaded North Africa at least three times. They brought an alien religion, Islam, language and customs to the native Berber tribes of the Sahara and the Mediterranean hinterland. In just 70 years, they had subdued the whole North of Africa. Central to this was the Arab slave trade. This was the practice of slavery in the Arab world mainly in Western Asia, North Africa, East Africa, and certain parts of Europe. It is argued by some scholars that the Arab slave trade was more devastating on Africans than the European slave trade. It is estimated that between the period 650 and 1900, between 10 and 18 million Africans were enslaved by the Arabs and taken from Africa across the Red Sea, Indian Ocean, and the Sahara Desert. Due to the nature of the Arab slave trade, it is difficult to give actual numbers. However, recently it was estimated that the Arabs took as many as 200,000 Sudanese children and women into slavery during the Second Sudanese War. Most importantly, even though Arab slavery was legally abolished and criminalized, it persists in such places as Libya, Mauritania, the Sinai Peninsula, and many parts of the Arab world. Following hot on the heels of the Arabs were the Europeans, who from the 14th century onwards transported between 10 and 12 million enslaved Africans across the Atlantic to the Americas. By, 80, by 1480, the Portuguese ships were already transporting Africans for the use of slaves on the sugar plantations on Cape Verde and the Madeira Islands in the Eastern Atlantic. Spanish conquistadors took African slaves to the Caribbean around 1502, but Portuguese merchants continued to dominate the transatlantic slave trade for another century and a half from the Congo to Angola. The Dutch became the foremost slave traders during the parts of the 1600s, and in the following century, the English and French merchants controlled about half of the transatlantic slave trade, taking charge of a percentage of human cargo from the region of West Africa between Senegal and the Niger rivers. The largest number of slaves were taken to the Americas during the 18th century. Historians estimate that three-fifths of the total volume of the transatlantic slave trade took place during this period. The transatlantic slave trade, as you know, is also synonymous with what is called the transatlantic passage or the middle passage. 
This is a phenomenon that is synonymous for its brutality and overcrowded unsanitary conditions on the slave ships in which hundreds of Africans were packed into tiers of the decks on the voyage, which was about 8,000 kilometers across the Atlantic. They were typically chained, and usually you had low ceilings, which did not permit them to stand off upright. The heat was intolerable, and the oxygen levels were so low that candles could not burn. It is estimated that between 15 and 25 percent of the African slaves that were bound for the Americas perished on those slaves, on those ships. The Europeans used to have a sport where they fed our ancestors to the sharks for fun as those ships were traveling. It's something that they played as a sport. A large percentage of the people taken captive were women in their childbearing age and young women who had been in a position to start their families. To better coordinate the invasion of Africa, the Europeans, through the French and the Germans, convened a series of gatherings which culminated in the repugnant act of the Berlin Conference of West Africa, signed on the 26th of February in 1885. I'm sure many of you have heard of the notorious Berlin Conference. There is an act that was signed at that conference. I was distributing it this week. I would be pleased if we can share this with the youth uh, of African hidden voices so that they know what our invaders plotted and planned and understand why we are in this mess we are in today. It is very important. This conference was attended by representatives of the United Kingdom, France, Germany, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Spain, the United Snakes of America, Italy, the Netherlands, Portugal, Russia, Sweden, Norway, Turkey. Africa's political and economic problems of the last 130 years have their genesis in this conference of thieves, looters, murderers, and rapists. Informed by their encounters with the Arabs, our ancestors got to learn that colonization was an inherently violent project, and this is why they responded in the most logical way through a series of legitimate revolutionary wars. For this reason, it is extremely important for the Africans of today to know and celebrate those of our warrior ancestors who fought gallantly against our Arab and European invaders. I talk here about the African slaves who led the Zanj rebellion in what is called modern-day Iraq. I talk here about Emperor Menelik II of Ethiopia, warrior Queen Ya Santawe of Ghana, Queen Mbandenzinga of Angola, Didan Kimati of Kenya, Samuel Maharere of Namibia, Mbuyane Handa of Zimbabwe, and Sukuru Kuvuvi also of Zimbabwe. Here, in the southernmost tip of Mutapa, I talk of Ingosu Pambata Gamanginza Zondi, the Strand Luapurus, the Korinkwa and the Kokosa in Doman. The area we are in today was an area that was, uh, in, the people who were in charge were people like Gogosa and Doman, and they were dispossessed from this area. David Stirman, Hosi Sikukuni, Hosi Mpulekeng Jainki, and of course, my direct ancestor, Uma Vubanga Nagandela Ntuli, who was one of the commanders who trounced the British in the Battle of Isanjuana in 1879. For all this, it becomes clear that the project or concept of decolonization is much older than the classical works of people like Franz Fanon, Chinwezi Ibekwe, Kwame Nkrumah, Nguki Wationgo, all of whom wrote on the concept of decolonization. Decolonization is also older than the student protests at UCT against the Statue of Rhodes. It's much more older. Informed by this context, for us as Africans, the essence of decolonization can therefore not be a calm academic debate, an elitist project to deliver one conference paper after the other, or a recital of revolutionary poetry. In my view, decolonization is essentially a violent confrontation between oppressor and oppressed. It is a bloody fight between the natives and the invaders, it is a choice between living on our knees and standing on our feet. 
as a consequence of all this, today much of Africa is dominated by Abrahamic religions, in particular Christianity and Islam. These two religions were central instruments in the project of Arab and European imperialism. Therefore, just as Christianity can't be separated from the discourse of European invasion of Africa, Islam can't be separated from the discourse of Arab invasion of Africa. It is disingenuous to have a conversation about our invasion by the Arabs or the Europeans, but you don't want to implicate Christianity in Islam. It is disingenuous. There is a huge project of intellectual denialism among some Muslim scholars, both black and white. One of them is the late, um, from Kenya, the late Ali Mazri, um, that aimed to make sure that there is no critical examination of the project of Arab colonization of Africa. There is a book I recommend by uh, one of our scholars, Professor Kwesi Pra, Reflections on Arab-led Slavery of Africans. It's a very instructive piece of work on understanding the invasion of the Arabs. In order to achieve this level of dominance, the Arabs and the Europeans unleashed wave after wave of violence on the bodies of Africans. Contrary to popular perception, Africans were not converted to Islam and Africans were converted to Islam and Christianity through violence. Africans must realize that when the Arabs and the Europeans invented Islam and Christianity, they did not have us in mind. We don't know what their agenda was when they created Christianity and Islam, but we go and join and adopt it. There is no precedent in human history where a nation or group was ever able to secure its development of freedom by adopting the worldviews of the very groups that enslaved or oppressed them. We Africans are the only people who think we can discover and develop ourselves through the race to the worldviews of our race enemies. Africans must wake up and realize that unless we embrace or develop our own concept of the divine, we will continue to be the spiritual captives of the Arabs, the Europeans, and all other non-African groups. In this sense, authentic African spirituality becomes a concrete understanding and an unshakable commitment to work towards the global resurrection of the African race. In other words, to achieve a state where we are fully in charge of all aspects of our lives as Africans and are no longer slaves and servants of any race on earth, we, what we ultimately define as African spirituality must empower us with the day-to-day -day fighting tools, mental and spiritual, to dismantle to dismantle our debilitating stage of spiritual castration. As an African people, we are a spiritually castrated people. I represent those Africans who are sick and tired of surrendering their time, money, resources, children, and most disturbingly, they are precious souls to the gods and religions of our invaders. They have done absolutely nothing for us as an African race except to tighten the rugged chains around our souls. Foreign Abrahamic religions call for Africans to be submissive, to close their eyes, be on their knees and totally submit to a foreign god. I call for Africans to be rebellious, to open their eyes, to stand on their two feet, and submit to nothing else but the irrepressible voices of our ancestors. We must reclaim our souls, my Africa. And this, I believe, must be the agenda of African spirituality, for us to reclaim our souls.
all groups that dominate African people, especially in the areas of economics and religion, have a distinct skin color. They generally decide, reside in one community. Their religion, politics, arts, culture, economics, or science are indivisible. They are not separate entities, they are one thing. Unlike us, you know, your science comes from another cultural group, your art, another, your religion, the names of your children, culturally confused we are. These groups that dominate Africans don't ordinarily join the institutions of Africans. One of our biggest problems, because we are a spiritually castrated people, we like to join the things of other people. And we take pride in joining the things of other people. Because we are culturally and spiritually confused and castrated. So we don't know what we are doing. Although we think we know, we don't. We are confused. They do this with one aim, to dominate or take over. So when these other groups, non-African groups, join our institutions, they don't join to come and assist. They join for two purposes, to dominate or to take over. And you see with our political parties, the majority of the black people in our political parties are black people, but the direction of those political parties is determined by the minorities. And many of them will fight with you on behalf of these foreigners in their political parties. Like we are seeing now if you watch the news. Central to the logic of their existence is something that is called a historical consciousness, which actually is race consciousness. In a nutshell, the groups that dominate Africans have a war mindset. For them, every sphere of people activity is a battle. As I understand it, therefore, the call for cultural decolonization is a matter of race security. What do I mean? To be able to dominate us culturally, our invaders such as the Arabs and the Europeans had to erase our culture and impose their culture. This is why today we are proud to speak their languages. We are proud graduates of their education. We support their businesses and are more than willing to surrender our souls and those of our children to their gods. Therefore, they have us completely captured in cultural terms. We Africans are a culturally infiltrated and captured people. My last point, how should we as Africans respond? Consistent with the principles of Afrocentric epistemology, and inspired by the spirit of our warrior ancestors, I propose the following responses. We must continue to tell our children and the youth of Africa that Africa is the genesis of the human race and that we produced unparalleled civilizations and knowledge systems, many of which were stolen by so-called Greek philosophers such as Thales, Aristocrats, Plato, Socrates, Hippocrates, Zeno, and Pythagoras. Many of the students you saw here were probably also misled by these so-called universities that the Greeks are the people who invented knowledge and philosophy. But when they encounter African hidden voices, African hidden voices tells them that is a white lie. We must tell our children that we had an advanced conception of the divine thousands of years before Christianity or Islam were even an idea, let alone it existed. Before it was even an idea, we had an advanced concept of the divine. When we say, like many of you who are former or current Christians, when you say Amen, Amen, you are referring to one of our ancient deities, Amun or Amen Ra. That's who you are calling, you are calling us, you are not calling the Christians, you are calling our ancient deity Amun or Amen Ra. We must tell our children that the Christian cross and the Ten Commandments are plagiarized versions of the Ankh and the 42 laws of Ma'at. I have the, uh, the, the Ankh here. 
the Christian cross was plagiarized from this, the symbol of life. We must tell our children that we must liberate ourselves from the education and the religions of the Arabs. We must liberate ourselves from the historical timeline of the Europeans and the Arabs because we measure time and progress according to their cultural clock. Lastly, we must build Afrocentric institutions across the continent that will orientate our children in the areas of spirituality, family, manhood, womanhood, politics, arts, science, and warfare. However, to be able to achieve all this, our point of departure has to be the decolonization of our minds and our souls. A colonized mind cannot decolonize anything because a colonized mind is essentially a captured mind, the mind of a slave, a glorified zombie, vulgar Africa.